My name is Cyprian Hackman. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I work on an internal platform, so related to things like this. Um, I'm also a maintainer for various projects inside the Kubernetes ecosystem. Um, and uh, usually do talks with Justin <laughs> on such topics. Hi there, my name is uh, Justin Santa Barbara. I am a software engineer at Google. I've been in the Kubernetes ecosystem for a long time. Uh, also involved in a number of projects, but um, primarily Cyprian and I work together on the KOps project. Um, we've been adding bare metal support uh, to that, um, but we've also discovered this is a broader topic, and so we want to talk about it with you. Um, don't worry, this is not the last slide. Uh, but we did put it in here. Um, this is a maintainer track talk, and we do, you know, so we're not going to stand up here for 25 minutes or 30 minutes and lecture you about, you know, everything we've been building and how it's the only one true way. Uh, we want to find out, you know, what are you doing? What would you like to see? Uh, whether it's in KOps or Cluster API or in the Kubernetes project itself, so that it lands in EKS, AKS, GKE, whatever it is, you know, just the whole topic. Um, obviously, you know, metal is not necessarily going to land in GKE, but uh, we can still at least talk about those sorts of things. So thank you in advance for your participation. We will be roaming through the audience. So please have your speaking hats on uh, and be ready to participate. Okay, so quick survey. What is metal? So which one of you use Kubernetes on metal? So. Okay, nice. Quite a lot of hands. So, what is metal for you? Right? It's a it's a very controversial topic. Could be your own machines in your data centers. Could be co-located data center. Could be also a cloud providers instances that you're not using some managed product or the cloud part. So. How do you how do you think about the cloud? Anyone? Like, hmm? I can go first. I, I for example, am running a handful of, um, of machines, physical machines, in my basement at home. Uh, in the winter months, it keeps me warm, um, and I would like to run Kubernetes on those. It's it's about five machines right now and, and growing. But I also, you know, I'm playing with AI, so GPUs are a big thing for for me. I said cloud equal easy world. So basically on bare metal, you have a lot of stuff to do to, imp uh, to deliver your Kubernetes on it. In the cloud, now, in the cloud, you already have all solution around it. So how easy, how easy can we make it? Right, I think that's a great one. And we're going to talk a lot about the challenges. Um, anyone else want to uh, speak up? Or should we go, go into some of those? Justin? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, about bare metal, I'm running Kubernetes since 28 on, on bare metal, and I experienced a lot of different stuff. Um, started with cube spray on machines in the office, moved over to named packet net, meanwhile Equinix Metal. Um, yeah, running a bunch of Raspberry Pis at home, which is bare metal for me. And yeah, I also experienced a lot of pain there tried chaos on um, OpenStack. There you get your private cloud, but OpenStack hurts. <laughs> so, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. We will be talking a little bit more about that topic, OpenStack, or the, the base layer in a little bit. Anyone else, or should we jump in? It's hard to see at the very back if anyone. Just raise your hand if you want to. All right. Go for it. I might take the stairs this time. So we, we did uh, we did a um, we do have a plan for how we suggest uh, going through this. Um, the, the primary reason being that when we sort of talk through it, answering the questions in this way uh, sort of helps us guide uh, the future answers. So you know, one of the first things we're going to talk about is uh, etcd volumes and failover and how we deal about that on bare metal, um, and that informs you know a bunch of the later decisions. So that's, this is the proposal. If anyone disagrees vehemently, stick your hand up high in the air. But uh, otherwise, this seemed to, I saw someone movement. I saw some movement. Otherwise, this, this flow hopefully will, will work well. Can do the first? 
Um, so, first thing is uh, with Kubernetes is that you have to have etcd, right? If you don't have etcd, there's no Kubernetes. Um, so, Cube API server is basically a wrapper around etcd. It's a it provides authentication, authorization, and various other nice things. But the main part is there. So, if you want to run a real cluster, you need redundancy, right? etcd gives you that, um, but it's, uh, it's painful. You can run with three, five nodes, with local storage, static addresses, um, can have backups for disaster recovery, or you can also have just a single node, you know, like play cluster, or you can, you know, pray that it never breaks. <laughs> okay. Um, you could also use NFS, iSCSI, or any kind of storage for bare metal, but the storage is kind of hard. Like, one of the hardest things in bare metal. If you get that right, uh, <laughs> everything is easy. So, we've been using etcd with um, local storage also. As long as you have three or five replicas, you can lose one at a time. So, unless you have a major event, it's not so bad. You can also have periodic backups, which should allow you to recover if you do it fast enough. But it involves a lot of work, manual work. So, is anyone going to run something more than a fixed set of nodes with repair or replacement? How do you plan to deal with that CD? Or do you do that right now? Any pain points? Any? I mean, I'll just mention also that this is one of, like, one of the things that we did in, in KOps and I think in a bunch of the managed providers is the automated replacement of failed etcd nodes. Um, but it's not clear on bare metal that that is something that can be done, should be done, or whether we basically are like, you know, I'm going to run with five because I'm willing to tolerate that, you know, that, that I, can, I want to lose two nodes because I know I'm going to have to physically go in and repair those nodes. I, there's no automated middle-of-the-night repair process on, bare, on my bare metal. Is, is that assumption, does anyone disagree with that assumption? Might anyone like to, I see first disagreement, that's excellent, that's why we're here. The only thing I would mention is we might want to take a leaf out of what we see in the storage world and consider a passive spare where you have three eligible members and a, a member on the side that can be built up in an automated fashion. If you lose one of them, if you're not willing to go to five to get failure out of etcd, or if you have different types of roles that might share a spare. That is an excellent, excellent point. Yes, and I think etcd is adding support for, I think they call them learners, is that right? I think it's a term like that. Um, and, and that will be very valuable there and might make the maintenance easier, thank you. Any other, any other thoughts on this particular topic? If we can, if we can basically agree that uh, with three plus one, we can work in this mode, we unlock all the rest of the roadmap, so. Any oh, more disagreement? Here we go. Uh, um, mostly just an alternate option for uh, Etsy backup instead of just object storage. Sorry. Instead of just object storage, could you know it could be database backup, alternate database backup, not just. Um. Great point. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. I mean, I think yes. The we'll talk a little bit about authentication as well to other things. Oh. This isn't so much a disagreement, but I happen to be at the at CD. Uh, special interest group meeting at lunch today and one of the topics that came up I guess is that Red Hat have been requested and now support a four node at CD uh, configuration so you don't get the backup for disaster recovery but if you have two separated sort of centers you have a mirror now so you'd have two in each rather than 
um, having two in one and one in the other, or vice versa. So just an observation of something that was kind of a passing comment. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, there is a, there's a etcd operator working group, or group, uh, SIG actually, I guess, that is uh, looking at all of these things, and hopefully we can leverage what they're building. Uh, this is related to the same question, what he asked. So instead of doing uh, one, three, five, uh, we are also looking into the options of doing just two etcd, right, because of the operational recovery needs where you have two nearby data centers, right, keeping one node in one side and one node on the other side. So what's your thought on that? I mean, I, I, my understanding is that historically etcd does not do well with even numbers of nodes. So they encourage three. Um, the, the learner mode, the plus one, is another like modification on that. I don't know how well one plus one works. With an arbiter. It's clever, yes. So like taking a dependency on something cloud-based or another site to help, yeah. It sounds like broadly though we, we like the general model and we're tweaking the, the number of nodes and the configuration of the nodes in the failover, which is great. And theme music, thank you. The, uh, all right, should we go on to the next top? Oh, sorry, Sam. Uh, I've seen a variety of cases in which you actually have to move etcd entirely. Um, and sometimes the network addressing of that changes. Uh, and it gets really complicated if you have to put uh, essentially one replica in a, a different network environment for a time um, and then eventually move the rest. So um, in the context of failover and the long-term life cycle of bare metal environments, especially more sophisticated ones, uh, you may end up with exotic cases such as that. And I don't know whether our tooling makes that easy yet. But I've seen cases where it certainly did not. I, I definitely agree that I don't think I've never seen any tooling that makes that easy. I agree with you 100%. It's a good, it's a good shout out. Shall we move on to the next topic or? I think I'm giving this ill advisedly. I've got to run up here. So this is sort of related actually. Um, on the topic of how we would go and discover etcd. Like, um, you want to roam? You want, you want to be the runner today? Yeah, go <laughs> The, um, etcd nodes have to find each other. Uh, the problem that we have specifically at this layer is this is before Kubernetes has come up at all. So this is, has always been a big problem to figure out. Uh, the thing that we would like to have that we get from clouds is something like an elastic endpoint. Um, that might be an elastic IP. It might be a load balancer. Uh, on something that works uh, in KOps or can work on bare metal is like you know modification of Etsy hosts. Uh, you could use dynamic DNS if you're willing to take a dependency on a DNS server, which of course might or may not be in your local environment, um, but might you know be out, outside in a nice way. Um, and I think that the discussion here is, like, is it okay to at least start with static IP addresses? Um, do we want to take a dependency on DNS? Uh, like, when people think about bare metal, how important is being able to survive, you know, a network disconnectivity event? Or it does it not matter because you're already running locally? Anyone have anything on that? Please raise your hands if you do. I see Sam again. Thank you. Um, at home, I'm sure I could survive a bit of downtime. Uh, in my day job, no, I'd rather not. So I will be using static addresses to the greatest extent as possible. Um, however, there are cases where I would prefer something like a VIP, um, which is not too far from an elastic IP. So um, it depends on the capabilities of my network at that time. So. I guess one of the questions I have is, are you distinguishing between a bootstrapping condition and an operational condition? Because it seems like how you choose that path of, you need one to start with, and then that could potentially get you running to then drive an operational to expand to many. And once you're to many, then you're less of an issue. So is, 
is this a you know an actual problem or is this a sequencing issue? I, I think it's a great topic, right? Like I, I think we should focus on the uh, end state and think about then separately how we can get there in the easiest way. Like ideally, we can get to the end state without introducing a second bootstrap technology. But yes, a great, a great point. Like, but in the in the long run, when things are uh, working normally, but sometimes maybe an etcd node is failing, like, are you okay with you know static IP addresses, perhaps virtual or semi-dynamic or layer two IP addresses. Um, but I, yeah, thank you, that is a great topic. Like the, the ability to bootstrap this is very, very interesting. Anyone else, like, it's difficult to see from up here. Oh, right, is that? There you go, there. There was, um, there was a conversation a couple days ago about Kubernetes on the edge here. And one of the use cases that they were talking about was Kubernetes clusters on like shipping vessels that only have like a 4G radio, maybe. And in those kinds of cases, I don't think they could rely on an external DNS anyway. And they probably don't have an internal one either. Great point. We never even mentioned uh, Edge, but it is certainly a, a big one for, for Metal. Um, so yeah, thank you for making Cyprian run. I like this. Uh, yeah, point to this. Uh, as we all know, it's always DNS. So um, how to skip this? Probably on the private. Um, even running a DNS server on its own, I was thinking about hostname announcing, I don't know, something DHCP style reverse announcing names, but then you're relying on DHCP and um, your own DNS server, which could also fail, so more redundancy there. Um, probably static addresses seeding into etcd host, maybe eight, yeah, that's probably the only way which could be sufficient, uh, failed safe enough with less resources than the other ones. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe one more and then we, yeah, we want to get, we're not going to make it through many of our lists. We weren't expecting to get through the whole list, but yeah. We... Yeah, just want to add, um, <coughs> sorry. Um, Similar to like that dependency thing is, um, I would also try to avoid as much dependencies on external systems as possible, because there's already the dependency on disk. Um, and from my experience, if you have a multi, multi-node etcd cluster, but all depend on the same backing storage, like something like an NFS server or something like that, and that one goes bad or gets very slow, that could also crash your cluster then. So. Sounds like a lot of consensus around IP addresses with perhaps a little bit of bootstrapping mechanisms, virtual IP addresses, floating IPs internally. Thank you. This is, uh, this is great. We're making good progress, I think, like this. OK, so next we're on to discovery for Cube API server addresses, right? Um, that's one of the smaller problems, but uh, there are still various issues. So, um, we can run this on Kubernetes. Um, we originally used uh, DNS, but uh, has uh, trended towards IP addresses these days. Um, DNS works, but it's, uh, it's still too hard. You, you have long delays between when you change something and when you actually get it for all your nodes. Um, multiple IP addresses is very hard. Um, and usually we use a load balancer to, to address these issues. Uh, for Metal, DNS is nice, uh, but usually means uh, an internet dependency or you have to configure your own. Um, Layer 3 load balancing with Metal LB mm, might work, or Cloud Load Balancer, like Cloud Flare, but you have to pay for that and accept these external dependencies. Um, so, 
Do you already have DNS load balancers? Should we use IPs? How, how do you see this becoming easier or better? Uh, yeah, therefore that we already tackled uh, at CD with static IPs, I would assume here the same, because of we already more or less know these same IP addresses, as long as we are assuming that that CD is running on these servers, on the masters. Um, yeah, I was shortly thinking about BGP magic, but I think this could get crazy. I think that's a good point. We seem to have this consensus on IP addresses just a minute ago, so that is helpful. There is a long-standing bug about multiple IP addresses in kubeconfig. It's just not supported today, and so, like personally, I've found DNS to be a nice little hack around that. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe we can have a virtual IP or whatever it is. Anyone else want to add anything? Oh, there we go. So in Cluster API, also I'm I'm from Cluster API. So in Cluster API, they're often similar to Metal LB is cube web used a static bot which runs besides um, etcd then basically, and um, yeah, then they try to find one who's the the leader or the pro provides the IP. So same same uh, topic with for ETCD, STD. So I think it depends on business and budget option, of course, and magic world trade-off. But uh, if emergency, uh, we use static IP because all DNS server will, uh, when happen, we don't know when it um, dying or servers. So we basically use Hostess and um, um, sorry, covering DNS layering. So there are uh, bottom to top. So use hostess and layering DNS and use root balancer and use VIP also. And setting uh, top of there, uh, we use a physical layer. So layering to, to network interface or and use two gateways. That's all budget. So it depends, I, I think, business, um, um, their sites. Yeah. Wonderful. That's, that's such a good point, like that we can actually combine these things. I suspect you're slightly higher budget than my uh, five machines in my basement. But yes, um, that's, thank you. Nope. Well, actually, I would like to speak a little about a bit DNS and load balancer. For DNS, we should care about cache, I believe, because if we will change DNS record, we must be sure that cache is removed. So it's unsafe to use DNS properly. The load balancer is another hope in our infrastructure, and I think we, that we would like to have as less hopes and works as possible, because it's a latency for our ETCD and kind of cluster is loaded enough, we will have huge load on our network and we, I, I think, would like to avoid it. And since we are using bare metal here, we are unlocked to level two of network. And on level two of network, we have VRP technology, which could allow us to use VRP to switch virtual IP address for our uh, UTCD service. So if server, for example, passed some health check, uh, it could switch VR virtual IP address to a proper one. Great point on the, uh, the TTL, thank you. And yes, like it seems like virtual IPs will be helpful there. Maybe we'll do one more on this topic and then move on. All right, the same one. All right, anyone else or? All right. Cool. Sorry. I actually just wanted to add a little bit on the load balancer part. Um, it's, it's great to use internal metal LB for the API servers, but like, it's essential if something goes wrong, you need an external load balancer to like for the ABI server. Otherwise, you do end up going straight to IP. It's just one of those things, right? So like external load balancer is preferable um, just for backup perspective. Thank you. Yes, and I think there's also you know this is a this is a bootstrapping problem as well. Also, right? Because we can bring it up uh, with 
you know, local host and run a bunch of these services and then and go from there. You can have multiple, ingress way, in, multiple ingresses or ways to ingress into your API server. We are, I'm conscious of time, so we will, we will run through this fast, I think. Bye. Go for it. I think we've talked about load balancer ingressing or API server. Hopefully, it's the same sort of thing. Um, I, I will frame the problem here by saying, you know, I think you brought it up, right? On the cloud, uh, the cloud basically makes a bunch of decisions about how networking works for you. And we have a cloud controller manager that will go and configure pod ciders on your nodes, for example, and do all of those. There is currently no cloud controller manager for bare metal that I know of. And so like, there are you know, a lot of decisions that we then have to make ourselves and things we have to do ourselves. I think the big one, at least from my perspective, is um, IPv4 or IPv6. Um, at least in my home, I, don't, I have one IPv4 address and more than I can count IPv6 addresses. And I think that's you know, sort of common that you have a lot more IPv6 addresses. And that, you know, is, this, is this the time, is this the place to be opinionated and say IPv6 is the great overlay and we should run that internally? Um, is this something we, should, we, can be, we have to be flexible about? How do people feel about taking a dependency on IPv6 or saying IPv6 is preferred and we don't need an overlay? Or do people want to run Cilium with encryption? Uh, and basically, basically, we stay out of this debate and make it maybe a little harder to run because we're being less opinionated. Anyone want to weigh in? Does anyone need IPv4? This is always going to be a fun one. Here we go. There are the hands. I knew it. I had to. Oh, sorry. Are you here? Thank you. When we're getting into the realm of metal and potentially dealing with inconvenient BMCs, I've definitely run into plenty that six to four breaks communication with, um, and that would be a major issue if the equivalent of the cloud controller manager were to be provisioning machines using those BMCs. I agree. I, I'm personally like using one which does the NAT, NAT 64, NAT 64 for me, and it works for my case. But yeah, it probably doesn't work for everything. <laughs> for better or worse, the uh, environment I work in often requires IPv4, uh, and isn't likely to change that due to regulations for a while. Fair enough. Yes, the, 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 te the technical versus the uh, regulations is is always a, a fun trade-off, and yeah. Anything else anyone wants to bring up here about like requirements for networking? I feel like basically we're going to be have to support most things, and we're going to end up in a world where you know we have we have a, an IPv4 configuration that that works, an IPv6 configuration that works, a Cilium configuration, a Calico configuration, and all those sorts of things. And it's not going to be we'll we'll have to each have a configuration set. And we can recommend our own, and I'm sure Cluster API will recommend one, and KOps will recommend one, and hopefully we can agree on which one to recommend. But uh, I think you know, if we both choose IPv6, there is still going to be a need for other scenarios. Anyone else? Everyone, you want to do the next one? about five minutes left. you want to do that? Go for it. OK, so um, next is storage and persistent volumes. We touched a bit on those with that CD. Um, but now that you have uh, Kubernetes clusters, um, you have other options. So simple local CSI. SEP or Rancher EBS, NFS, iSCSI, so all as CSI driver. You can mix, match multiple. Do you think that's enough once you have the cluster up and running, or should be something more complex? Like we have persistent volumes for instances directly. Also, add kubefs to the list of uh, software-defined storage that was mentioned this morning in the keynote. So, uh, like I, we didn't update our slides. I apologize. Okay, does anyone have any particularly? I think this one is fairly straightforward because we basically can just support everything type thing, and it, you sort of pick whatever you want. And I don't think there's any like intricate dependencies. I don't know if anyone has any particular requirements that they think might throw a wrench in that in that plan.
Uh, this maybe gets into the, not the application layer of storage, but into the node level storage. Um, are we doing anything in the way of, um, uh, in this scope, evaluating things like encryption of the local drives on which you deploy at CD or, you know, the API servers and everything else, um, uh, and even the worker nodes? Uh, do we want security? Do we want RAID or resilience uh, of local storage? Um, there, there's a lot of other considerations there, at least in the life cycle of a given host that I don't see on the slide. And I would say I have my own opinions, um, but I, I would like to hear what everybody else's use case demands. I think that is a great point. I think we have a, we have a final slide that I will sneak a, a, a sort of a intro about. Um, but uh, we do have some, we're going to talk about, the, uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit in terms of provisioning of the OS. Oh, there's a one right there. but. Uh, if we run out of time, it's not a problem because that final slide, you will see, I will give you a clue, it's a working group that we're proposing. My question is related to hyperconvergence. Uh, so when you do CEP4, Ranger, or whatever storage solution you bring in, what is your recommendation on running it as a hyperconverged model with direct attached disk, or you run it as a separate CEP storage nodes? So, we want to hear from you. I don't think we have a recommendation, right? I think the I think the nice thing here is it probably doesn't matter too much at the Kubernetes level. It's a, absolutely a cost for you, but like if, if you're optimizing for cost, you will you can use uh, one of the local CSI drivers, right? If you already have a NetApp, you can use NFS on NetApp, right? So I think that would be sort of how we would view it, and this is probably gonna be another one where we don't need to be very opinionated at this level. The encryption of things like the etcd volume are lower level, and that's, I guess, the next topic. Which, should I talk to that one quickly? Uh, okay. But we have, we have more. Why don't we, should we wrap it up, or do you want to talk about these? Wrap. Let's wrap it up. Okay, yeah, I think we're, we're very close to time, so. Um, we have some more topics. We're going to upload our slides, so please feel free to take a look at them and find us on Slack. However, in general, um, the, the big, I think, topic is how, how can we move forwards from here, right? Like, I, th I thank you for all for participating. Uh, the, there are some great topics here. Um, there is a QR code there where you can leave your reviews, um, but we would actually much rather that we, you came and uh, that we all were able to discuss this in a way that is uh, sort of vendor neutral. So whether you're cluster API KOps, whatever it is, like these topics seem to be common across all of our projects. And I, th I am proposing with Cyprian that we start a working group in SIG cluster lifecycle to address this. Uh, working group medal is the sort of working title. Um, if you would like to participate in that, um, please join SIG cluster lifecycle on Slack and we will, we will uh, go from there. Um, but thank you all so much for participating. Cyprian and I will hang around a little bit. Uh, we can talk about sort of what your um, you know, what, some more of the topics that we've, we've covered. And um, uh, I really feel like we made a ton of progress on those first topics, which were the really tricky ones. So thank you all very much. <laughs>